Hi everyone. My name is Dr. Shira Daron and I'm an infectious disease physician and the hospital epidemiologist at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. Welcome to the first episode of my new vlog, A Dose of Reason. Because of the nature of my job, I get a ton of questions from patients, coworkers, friends and family about the COVID-19 pandemic every single day. Questions about things ranging from vaccines and booster shots to school safety and mask mandates. I read the latest research and I try to adjust my opinions as the science changes. There are times when the media may not get things quite right. Often things are not as bad as they may seem and there are always ways to protect yourself. I wanted to start this vlog to bring a dose of reason to the most pressing questions about the news of the week and to try to explain some of the nuance in the science. There isn't necessarily a right answer to every question, but you can make the best decisions for yourself if you're armed with knowledge. You can send me your questions about the pandemic, the upcoming flu season, or anything really related to infectious disease to a dose of reason at tuftsmedicalcenter.org. Please include your first name and hometown with your question. I'll select a few of the most common to answer with every blog. Our first question comes from Rose Marie in Taunton who asks, every day the story changes about COVID-19 booster shots. It seems the CDC, FDA, and White House can't get on the same page on the best plan. So what am I supposed to believe and how do I know if I should get one? Huh, Rose Marie, this has just been one of the most confusing pieces of messaging of the entire pandemic. I totally understand where you're coming from. I really have struggled with this question about booster shots since we started talking about it. There have been so many parts of this pandemic that were so confusing to understand, and this is probably the number one. And I have to say that my own opinion about booster shots has really evolved over the last few weeks or, or even months. I really started out sort of anti-booster. Um, and really the reason behind that was that the first mention of booster came from the CEO of Pfizer. And I didn't think that that was where we should be learning our science from. Um, certainly not from somebody who stands to make billions of dollars off of the outcome. And then the second sort of mention of booster came from the White House. And I didn't really think that was appropriate either. You know, it felt like the appropriate steps weren't being followed. The clinical trial should be done. The data should be submitted to the FDA. The FDA's independent advisory council should review it. The FDA should approve it. Then the CDC should recommend it. Those are the appropriate steps. And it felt like they were being bypassed. And so I was skeptical. But over time, the data that led to the decision to start planning for the boosters have been released. I've had a chance to review the data. And more importantly, I listened to every minute of the hours long meeting of the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee of the FDA. That's an external advisory committee with no conflicts of interest um, and no reason to say yes to something that they don't believe in. And I listened to a lot of nuanced discussion at that meeting. I also listened to two days of meetings by the Advisory Council of Immunization Practices at the CDC, and a lot of nuanced discussion there too. And, and here's what I've sort of concluded. At first I thought, well, the vaccines are still really protecting us against severe disease, and you know, mild infection is probably something we're going to live with forever due to this virus. And so we don't really need to prevent mild infection. We need to prevent severe disease. And I didn't think the evidence was strong that we're experiencing more severe disease in those who are vaccinated. I, I still think that most people, the vast majority of people, are very well protected against severe disease. But one of the things I've sort of changed my tune on is how important it is to protect people against mild disease. Because mild disease means contagious. And because the vaccines are able to prevent mild disease, or at least they were in the clinical trials initially, and at least they are in the early months. And so since we don't have a supply issue, and since I've become more convinced over time that the White House and others are 
paying attention to the much more important problem of global vaccine equity and vaccine availability for lower income countries, I'm sort of coming around to the idea that the vaccines are really, really safe. And as a result, it makes sense to try to boost our immunity and prevent even mild infection. A lot of the data on severe infection is coming out of Israel. I think there are potentially flaws in the studies. I'm not sure that there's enough evidence to justify that people with a single comorbid condition are necessarily at increased risk of severe disease. But again, the vaccines are so widely available now and so safe that I think we could quibble about the exact wording of the CDC and FDA's recommendations around who should get it. But I think it's okay uh, that we have developed a booster plan and that boosters are being given out today. And yesterday I went and got my booster shot and today I feel pretty good. I went to the gym this morning um, and I feel like in a couple weeks I'm gonna be really feeling like I did my part as an essential worker to avoid even a mild case of infection that's going to keep me out of my job that I really need to be here to do. Our next question comes from Mara from Ashland. And she says, I saw the Massachusetts Commissioner of Education extended the mask mandate in schools until November 1st this week. They said after schools reach an 80% vaccination rate, the mask mandate can be dropped, but the CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics have not changed their stance on masks in school. Can it really be okay to drop the mask mandate based on vaccination rate? Thanks for the question, Mara. I think there is probably not a single more polarizing issue right now than the question of masks on children in schools. I think nobody's in the middle on this. There are parents who feel so strongly that they want everyone in school to be wearing masks. There are educators who feel so strongly. There are public health officials who feel so strongly about this. And on the other side, there are parents and students and others who feel equally strongly that masks are having a detrimental effect on children in schools and that the evidence may not be strong enough to support having a mask mandate in schools indefinitely. And I think that the way to bridge the divide between those two groups is to set metrics and what, what has been now referred to as off-ramps. Assuming that we are not going to have children wear masks in schools forever until the end of time, it makes sense to state now what appropriate metrics would be to remove them. Um, so the Commissioner of Education of Massachusetts has set a, a metric of 80% vaccination rate. You know, of course, that's only going to be applicable in high school right now and maybe middle school based on the eligibility of the students um, below 12 uh, to be vaccinated, which, as we know, um, the vaccine for that age group hasn't yet been approved. So when we look at a high school that has an 80% vaccination rate of students and staff, we know that that could mean as, as many as 20 people unvaccinated. We also know that the vaccine isn't 100% effective, so that's not fully 80% protection against all infection and all transmission. We also know that among the 20% who are unvaccinated, there is a decent proportion that have had prior COVID and therefore carry some immunity from that. And there are calculations and mathematical models that you can use and that have been used to try to assess at what rate of vaccination or immunity you're likely to achieve a fair amount of protection from an outbreak becoming really large and really catching fire and affecting a large number of people. The other piece is that you definitely wanna prevent learning loss. Our kids have been out of school or at least not in full-time school for a long time and we don't want any of them to have to go back into remote learning. Now the good news is that children who have been vaccinated and teachers who have been vaccinated right now across the country and in Massachusetts do not need to quarantine when they're exposed. So quarantines are not a major risk in schools with at least 80% vaccination. The other thing that Massachusetts is a real leader on and I'm just so happy about is that for children who are unvaccinated or not eligible to be vaccinated, 
we have the Test and Stay program, which is really an amazing program that is designed to keep children in school even if they have an exposure to anyone else who might be infected in the school. Um, so an in-school exposure puts a child into the Test to Stay program, which then means that they get tested every day on their way into school and they get to go to school if they are not positive. That's been shown in a really well done clinical trial to be just as safe as putting them in quarantine because the rate of conversion to positive is so low. So I do support at this point the commissioner's recommendation to remove the mask mandate at 80% vaccination rate especially because it looks like Massachusetts is turning the corner and cases are coming down. Now, if cases were to go back up, I might have a different feeling. Um, but the country as a whole and Massachusetts appears to be rounding the corner on the Delta surge, and that's all good news. Our last question comes from Ben in Newton. Ben asks, I live in Newton where there is a mask mandate, but I shop in Wellesley where there is not. I was wondering if that's safe. But then I saw that Provincetown, which had such a big outbreak in July and was the first in the state to institute a mask mandate, has dropped their mandate. So how do these towns even decide whether to have mask mandates or not? And what should we be doing to protect ourselves? This is a great question, Ben, and um, it's something that I've been struggling with a little bit. Um, how do you decide when you should have a mask mandate, how effective are mask mandates, and what's the best way to deal with rising cases in this post-vaccination era? Well, as you recall, in May, the CDC announced that vaccinated people could take off their masks. And that was because data were showing that when you're vaccinated, the vaccine is not just amazingly effective at preventing you from having a symptomatic infection, they're also amazingly effective at preventing an asymptomatic infection and transmission. Now, some people were nervous about that idea of only vaccinated people being able to take off their masks because it meant that unvaccinated people would probably take off their masks as well. And, you know, that may have been part of what contributed to the Delta surge. Um, the Delta variant is extremely contagious, and we do need to take additional precautions as a result of that. Now, in July, partly or maybe largely as a result of the big Provincetown outbreak, the CDC announced that with the Delta variant, vaccinated people can transmit infection. Now, of course, vaccinated people probably always could transmit infection. It's just that the vaccine is less effective against the Delta variant. We see more breakthrough infections and we started seeing higher viral loads in their nasal passages. Well, since that announcement, we've actually seen that higher viral loads don't necessarily translate to being as contagious and an, as an unvaccinated person. And in fact, viral loads drop quite precipitously in vaccinated people as your immune system kicks in as a result of vaccination. We've also seen that the vaccine still really, really prevents you from getting infected in the first place. And if you're not infected, you're not transmitting any infection. Now the CDC said, if your cases are above a certain rate, your town, county, state, should have a mask mandate. But at the same time as they said that back in July, they released this MMWR report it's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, where they gave a little more nuance to that discussion around mask mandates and other mitigation measures that locales, health authorities, or organizations should have in place. And it was really about more than case rates. You also need to consider vaccination rates. You also need to consider hospital capacity. You also need to consider your ability to detect a problem, a rising case problem, your testing capacity, your testing programs in schools and other institutional settings. And you also need to consider whether you're properly protecting your vulnerable individuals. When you take all of that together in Massachusetts, we're actually checking all the boxes. We're really doing quite well. We did see a bump in hospitalization, but compared to the rest of the country, we're probably best of all the 50 states in our hospitalization rates right now. So what I would say is that I think that Governor Baker's decision not to institute a statewide mask mandate was evidence-based. I think that individual towns are instituting mask mandates based on a lot of different pressures and based on a lot of different factors that go into decision-making. 
I think they'll struggle to figure out when to remove them um, because they don't always have scientific experts and epidemiologists to inform those decisions. But I also believe that we each have the ability to protect ourselves when we're in a situation that makes us uncomfortable, i.e. a situation where you might need to come in close contact with somebody whose vaccination status you don't know. That's all the time we have for this week. Thanks so much for your excellent questions and be sure to keep them coming to a dose of reason at tuftsmedicalcenter.org. I look forward to dishing out a dose of reason to you again next week. <laughs>